Mixing for live sound is very, very different than mixing for a record. Sometimes people have asked me in the past, would you do live sound for my band or this or that? And honestly, it's like a whole different thing. And I don't usually prefer to do it because it's such a different thing. And also you're so dependent on the place to, to actually be able to get something that sounds great. But it's also a whole different gig. You got to travel more. Like you got to actually pack stuff up, take it with you, have road stuff. I mean, it's just totally different than if you mix in a studio all the time with your gear in the same place and you know the room and the, you know the monitors. It's a whole different thing. In a, in a studio, you're usually mixing in stereo because you want to get the widest stereo picture you can get. When you're mixing live, you mix in mono. Now, Dave Natal, who mixed for the Rolling Stones, Prince, Van Halen, Tina Turner, Jeff Beck, this guy is the top of the top. He did an interview on Rick Beato's channel where he breaks down his EQ that he, that he uses live, the way he gets stuff to sound great, how he can get tons of volume. There's some crossover here. You will definitely find there's some stuff you'll be able to use on your own mixing by learning his EQ moves and his style. So I want to play this for you, then we'll talk about why it works. But... You just have to know, keep this in mind, he's using this graphic equalizer called the TC Electronic 6032. This thing has specific points on it. That's why he's picking the frequencies he's picking. So when you listen to this video, I want you to keep in mind that the reason he's saying he's lowering here or lowering there, he doesn't have the choice of everything in between. He's got a few choices, and I'm going to show you what it looks like afterwards, but watch this video real quick, then we'll talk about it. This is fair use for teaching purposes. Fair use for teaching purposes. You like the drum sound? Love the drum sound. Okay. Do you, do you even though I mix balls loud, just because it's more fun. But beside it being loud, it's not painful. No. Okay. So how I do it <clears throat> is when I EQ, this is a graphic, I still use a graphic. Yes, I'm old, I'm bald, right? So I start off by EQ and stuff. I leave 20 to 80 flat, flat zero. That's the most low end you can get out of the PA because I have all the other frequencies pulled down, really all the way out, neg 15. I play the James Newton Howard and Friends CD, and then I just start adding back in to the maximum amount of low end. Now I know that 160 sounds horrible. It sounds horrible on drums. I think it sounds horrible on everything. So I, I hate 160, so I leave 160 out at neg 15, always. So at 80 hertz, it starts to come down, and 160's out the whole way, because I hate it. Uh, an octave of 160 is 315. I've, I've skipped a few frequencies in here, because uh, 315 is an octave of that. You know, it comes back up, drifts around. Around 315, it's down a little bit. Back up, 400, 500, and then it come, drops back down at 630, because that's an octave of 315, yep. which is an octave of 160, which I still hate. So then it kind of drifts around back up close to flat around 800, um, 1K. But this is the stuff that hurts. 2K, 2.5, 3.15K, 4K. That stuff hurts. That's pain. When you start hurting people, they will have no time for you. You, you suck. They will not listen to your stuff. You can't listen if, to it. If That's right. it hurts, you can't. And this all comes from... Uh, when I mixed Tina Turner, yeah, her manager wanted it as loud as I could get it. But I would have grandma, the kids, their kids, and their kids' kids coming. You know, four generations of people coming to a Tina show. Right. You can't be hitting grandma with, no. you know, 2.5K. It's, it's literally painful. It's painful. Yes. It's painful. So this is kind of how it evolved to be this way because I had to get it as loud as humanly possible without hurting people. If you take the pain away, which I do, I dump this stuff out of the PA, and at 5K, I'm flat again, flat, zero. It's flat, and it's flat all the way up to 20K. Take the pain away and take this cloudy shit in the middle out of the way. The drums will sound better because of that, and so will the vocals to a certain extent. Take the pain away, and people will listen to it as loud as humanly possible. Now, that's just what I say. As I stated before, you'll probably get fired if you do this because this is weird. It is. Nobody does this. I have never seen well, you're anybody. You're doing this on an analog console too. I know, but 
I have never seen anybody EQ anything like this, even back in the day when we were all using analog. It's just a severe thing. <clears throat> but, but Dave, I can attest to this, that these are, everything you said is true. These are the pain frequencies. These I, are the mud frequencies. Well, this, the drum stuff sounds better like this. I, I used to play drums in a previous life. And I know for a fact by experimenting that this stuff makes drums sound like shit. And this stuff, I know for a fact, hurts because I've experimented on myself. You want to mix really loud? This is what I do. It's it's not very a very technical drawing, but it, it's a generality. And then, Dave, and then you're EQing on the individual channels. Bass and then drum. I'm EQ, I EQ, like, if necessary, I'm not afraid to turn stuff up and down, neg 15. Well... I don't boost a lot of anything. I don't boost anything on the system, and I don't boost a lot of things. I, I cut, I cut, and I cut, and I cut. So let me highlight what I thought are the most critical parts of this video. Number one, he's got to focus on the frequency he hates the most, which is 160. An octave of the 160 gets him the closest thing he can get on his machine that he's using. The TC Electronic 6032 is 315. So he's got the 160, the 315, and the 630. Let me just show you what it looks like real quick. So this thing is what he's using. And if you notice right here, you got 160. So since that's the thing he hates, he's lowering that all the way. And then he's, it's coming up a little. He said not to flat, but a little bit up at the 200, which is the next option. Then 250, a little bit. That's the next option. But then it goes back to zero at 316, it says on here. He said 15, but this says 16. Maybe it's a slightly different model he's using. I don't know. But 160 and 316 or 15 is the closest thing to an octave. Then we got 630. Okay, and that's obviously an octave from the 315, and that's the close. Like that is an octave, but his choice, if he wanted to go below, it would be 500. But he's saying make the 500 not quite flat, but let it live. It's not at negative 15, and the same thing with 400. Let it live. So he's down at nothing at 630. He's down at nothing at 315. He's down at nothing at 160. Everything in between it lives, and. The other way, from 160 to 180, it's a diagonal line from the negative 15 up to the to the 80 hertz, not 180, to 80 hertz, from 160 to 80 in a diagonal line, and then flat, zero across the board. So the critical things here, he's not boosting low end. A lot of people come in, the first thing they want to do, especially live, is they turn up the low end. The speakers can't reproduce it over a certain amount, and you're just making it harder to now turn everything up because your low end's clipping everything. It's, this is the same with mixing. I find people do this a lot, so just let's keep in mind, it's not always the re best move to boost low end. Also, let's keep in mind, it's not always the best move to boost high end. There's so many different times I've seen live bands and I've been like, ow, this hurts. A lot of times people think stuff doesn't sound good. Their first instinct is to turn up the mids, turn up the highs. Well, what did he, what was he saying? He's saying 2K to 4K, that whole zone is the painful zone. That's the zone that will prevent you from making things louder also because it will bite. It will come in and bite your ears and be painful and that is gonna not work. So if you keep your mind in the sense of the mix bus can't have these areas so cranked, lower those on your mix bus a little to do what he's doing, right? Or just think about it like if things are biting you in your mix, you know, your mix that you're making for a record, not live stuff, it could be because 2K to 4K, somewhere in there, is too much bite from something. Whatever's hitting you too hard. If it's guitars you're hearing that are hurting you, look at the guitars, look at 2K to 4K. If it's, you know, cymbals, if it's drawn, like just figure out what's hurting you, where it's hurting you. You know, it, like that could be a snare too bright at 3K, too, like just look at what it is that's ruining your life at that zone and then lower it, all right? Also, this is a guy who doesn't use effects live. We're talking best of the best. He's not even gating drums. He's not compressing everything in sight. All he uses compression on, he's using a limiter on the vocal so that he can make sure that that is as loud as it can be and you can hear every word. So he's limiting it so that when the singer gets too quiet, you can actually hear that. And if they get crazy and they get loud, and they get, it's not going to hurt everybody's ears. But So he's got some limiting on that and he's able to turn it up over the band. Very, very critical. All right. So these are the biggest critical tips. Also, he doesn't like using effects live because it's another point of failure. 
that point of failure means anytime you got that send and return going, if there's there's another chance for a cable situation, for a faulty something to come in and ruin a Super Bowl performance. And that's what he's doing. This guy's top of the top. So he's doing sound for the Super Bowl. It's got to be flawless. Everything you add is another thing that could go wrong when you're doing live. So many reasons I don't like doing live live stuff. I don't like packing up stuff to constantly travel, unloading stuff, setting stuff up. Every room is different. It's a so much different gig. Some people love it. Some people hate it. I don't like it very much. Uh, you know, at this point where I'm at in my career, I don't love it. It, some people might, but it's every room is literally different depending on the decor, depending on the ceiling, depending every single thing matters. Like if you got tin, if the walls are made of tin, it's going to sound like tin. Yeah, I mean, literally everything matters. Some rooms you're going to need to put maybe a little something in, you I mean, maybe a touch of reverb because it's a very dead room. Some you'll have to put none because there's already way too much before you even start. You know, I, we played so many rooms where just having any effects on anything were terrible in the PA. It had to be totally dry because the room itself was so wet. Bands mention, you know, he said every band knows what good sound is in terms of if they're playing a stadium or something, they all don't want the dome on the roof. How interesting is that? If they're playing a place with a retractable dome, none of them want the dome on there. So if the weather is permitting, they never want the dome if they have a choice because now sound can escape. It doesn't just bank all over the place and then, you know, come back at you. So another thing he mentions is the best sounding stadiums are the old school, like Rose Bowl stadiums where... They basically the Rose Bowl Stadium, I think he mentioned, has it's it's like not that tall, but it's also no overhangs, no overhangs, no dome, no partial dome. None. So because of that, the sound can escape and it just gets to people and doesn't bank off everything and cause problems. So when he's trying to mix for the guy who's a sitting a zip code away, like he said, he doesn't want tons of effects also because by the time they get to him, it's going to smear and blur everything. So there's so much t t stuff to what he's saying. Also, he mixes in mono one side at a time, which, you know, if you're doing live, consider doing that. Check your left speaker, then check your right speaker and literally don't try to mix in stereo. Make it mono. So very, uh, like, this guy's got tips upon tips upon tips. Another one, the weather makes a difference to the sound. I started thinking about this from a studio perspective, like, because what he said was the, the hotter and more humid it is, that means water's in the air, and that means the highs won't get through as easily. So things sound less bright. So I started to think about the old school studios that were, you know, like the uh, Muscle Shoals and things like that, that were, you know, super like, you know, climates that were hot. So because of that, that's part of the reason, I think, why those sounds are so warm, thick and not so bright and painful. I mean, granted, they're using tape and a whole bunch of other stuff, but... You know, it's old school, so everything analog, everything tape, I get it. But what I'm saying is there's that climate factor. I wonder if that only applies to stadiums or if it also just applies to a place that's super hot and humid all the time. I mean, there's maybe something to this. So what he said was when it's cold and dry, that's the most, like, tinny the sound is going to be. Whereas when it's hot and it's humid, the most uncomfortable, that's actually when it's the best sound. So think back to any times you've experienced concerts and maybe how, you know, the best sound you've ever heard was like the most uncomfortable day you've ever been a part of. Because I could think of a couple experiences like that myself. Also, the reliability of analog, like drop anything in the comments you guys have about those kind of concerts you've ever attended that were super, you know, uncomfortable, but also the best sounding stuff ever. Because I'd be really curious to hear about that. Also, when it comes to analog sound, you know, analog being reliable, digital being reliable, I had a situation where I bought this great console, right? Because I had used an analog console for m like months and months and months and months, tons of shows, mul you know, multiple shows in a weekend. And I was basically, this was all for my band doing live sound because, you know, why not? And when I was doing it, I just noticed the analog console just worked flawlessly, never had an issue. It was very basic console, you know, set up right next to the stage so I could basically do both. And I wore in here so I could kind of just walk out and hear what was going on. And I could take the in-ears out and just basically hear what was happening in the room. And then I'd, you know, have my own mix going on. So it was my own way of doing it. Analog console worked flawlessly. I 
wound up upgrading to a digital console that wasn't a cheap console because there were a few things coming up where there was going to be multiple bands and I just wanted something a little better. I upgraded to this console and it wasn't two weeks I was using it where one time the the memory card that I was using to to basically record everything that was happening, you know, I was multi-tracking everything using the built-in recording and the memory card filled up, the thing went into some freezing glitch weird situation and all of a sudden everything went down. The sound disappeared. And this wasn't for my band. This was for another band. And I can't tell you the feelings that went through my head and the words and the expletives that was going on what like in my own head while this was happening. I was bugging out, to say the least. And I got rid of that thing immediately because that was the craziest situation that I'd ever experienced. And I never experienced that before with analog. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure it was user error. You know, I'm sure I didn't do something or whatever, but it wasn't intuitive. Why would it kill all the mic pre's and everything just because the memory card filled up is beyond me. I have no idea why anybody would build anything to work like that. Or That was crazy. Maybe I did something wrong, but that was crazy. And it just made me realize like, wow, I totally get what he means because any down sound of any kind, if you're reliant on a computer, we all know things go down. He's using an old school Yamaha from the 80s to do sound for the Rolling Stones. Like, what are we talking about here? It's working great. And he never has a problem. He's using the least amount of things that could possibly fail on him. I totally get it. Because if you've ever been in a situation like I was in, you know what it's like to have a computer just all of a sudden decide to be a computer. It's like, oh man, you couldn't have picked a better time, you know? But I've also had it the other way. I actually played a show where there was a hired sound crew doing sound for like three bands and the the sound crew was not, you know, a good sound crew. They showed up late, their stuff wasn't working, like half their PA, they wound up having to swap out for other PAs. It was like the guy was soldering something on the spot. The sound cut out from the PA or like, I don't even know if it ever worked to begin with or if it just like worked for a minute and then cut out. But it was, the guy was trying to fix stuff the whole time. And if you've ever seen Wayne's World where, you know, they're in Garth's basement in the beginning and there's like a fire at the console and the guy pulls out a wrench and starts beating on the console with a wrench. If you've ever seen that, <laughs> a guy trying to put a fire out with a wrench, that's exactly what we were looking at. Like, it was absolutely crazy what was going on in front of us. So that was an analog console, but it wasn't one that was well-maintained, just like the rest of that gear. So we've seen it all. It's been there. It's, you know, people who've done this, I'm sure you guys have stories. I'd love to hear about it. All right, throw it in the comments. This is Evan Jaffe, Custom Cut Studios. Subscribe if you haven't already. You guys got this. Talk to you soon. Take it easy.